It's time for another episode of Espresso Yourself with Chuck. And now, coming to the mic, your host, Mr. Chuck Knapp. All right. Well, if you're a KU basketball fan, you know of Jeff Geldner. He was a starting guard for the KU 1988 NCAA National Championship basketball team and a current co-host of Jayhawk Game Day Live, which is the program before and after every KU basketball game. And now, added to his resume, is author. He has recently (laughs) written a book, Without You, A Story of Thanks and Appreciation. So it is my pleasure to welcome Jeff Geldner to Espresso Yourself with Chuck. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me. Well, Jeff, let's uh, let's just jump in. Uh, there are so many things we could talk about in your book. Uh, I could spend a lot of time just talking about KU basketball, but but right. this book is so much more than that, which would be enough for me. But <laughs> even the subtitle, "A Story of Thanks and Appreciation," I'm interested first why you decided to write a book. Well, there's no doubt it's a balancing act. Obviously, KU basketball is huge, and people want to talk about and hear about all these deep, dark stories and have me make fun of all my teammates and all that kind of stuff. And and uh, while there is some of that in there, um, that was not the message, overall message that I was going for. Um, obviously, I have a lot of love and appreciation for the for my teammates, and we shared a lot of great things. But really, this was about kind of me. Um, after I got sick, I was diagnosed with cancer in 2010, and, and that was kind of a turning point for me emotionally. Um, it also led to a kind of a downhill spiral with divorce and, and, and career issues and things like that that I had to overcome. But uh, those that know me well know I became a lot more emotional following um, all of that ordeal. Um, and uh, I lost my, I've lost my mom since, and, you know, my dad's in his early eighties and, and there are just so many people that have played a role in my life, um, that, you know, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for them. And, and I really thought that, you know what, KU basketball aside, there's a message here and there's, there's, uh, there are lessons to be learned. Um, uh, we can apply to our daily lives, whether it be perseverance or just being thankful for those that, that care about us and that, that do go the extra mile. Um, there were a lot of ways to go. And ironically, I was listening to a Luke Combs song without you. And it was granted. One of the things that I do when I listen to music, I don't just, I pay attention to the lyrics, whatever the song is. And, and Hey, can I apply this to my life? Was there a lesson here? You know, sometimes it's really stupid, but a lot of, that's a song that really kind of made sense to me. Granted, it's about a country singer and not a basketball player, but um, you know, about his parents and everything that they went through and the sacrifices that they made because, you know, he wouldn't be them without them. And, and I felt like that message applied to me as well, starting with my dad and my parents and all the way through with coaches and, and teammates and doctors and, and then obviously family as well with my kids and, and, and new wife. And, and, and really, there's just so many things. Um, and like you said, it's easy to talk KU basketball, but this has been a real emotional journey for me to really kind of dive into the negatives and and I generally will cry at least once and I read the book myself. And, then, you know, and as Jeff Bolig, who was so gracious to, you know, do this for me, um, you know, I've known him for 30 years and to be able to do this with him, uh, I trusted him. And, uh, you know, he brought up a lot of good stories as well. And it was just it was just an overall very rewarding experience. Jeff Bolig. Um is a former associate director of the KU Sports Information Department. Uh, I actually was a senior when you were a sophomore at KU and was a student assistant in the sports information office. And Jeff is a great, great guy, a wonderful relationship guy. And Mm -hmm. so I can understand why you would have trusted him to help tell your story. Uh, and, And I'd like to kind of go back because you mentioned emotions and that maybe you weren't real emotional before maybe cancer and some of these other things happened. And maybe that's because there wasn't a lot of emotion necessarily from your parents. If I got the, if I got that right in the book and mm-hmm. I don't want to spoil right. the book because people need to read it, right. but let's, let's go back to your younger days. You were, you were a good athlete, a uh, multi-sport mm-hmm. athlete, um, but not really heavily recruited because of the time there's no social media 
you know, just none of the recruiting services that there currently are. Can you tell us about growing up in Illinois and kind of how you got to KU and the role your parents played in that process? Yeah, and, and really it goes back even even farther than that. My dad was a, a CPA at Pete Marwick, so he was in the big six and kind of up, you know, that was his career path. And then when I was born, he kind of gave that up and became a professor at Eastern Illinois University there in Charleston, Illinois. My mom was a, was a grade school teacher as well. And then as I got a little bit older, she took some time away so she could be home with me. Um, we didn't have travel basketball. There was no AAU. That whole circuit really didn't come through in Charleston. So I played basketball when it was basketball season. And then as soon as we lost or whatever, it was on to baseball. And we did some traveling for baseball, but combination of games and camps and, and you know, and it really carried all the way through KU. My parents were always there. And anytime I needed to pitch to somebody or, or have somebody hit grounders to me or catch me or play one-on-one or just work on sports in general my dad took the time to do that and and when you're young you just think that's well that's what you're supposed to do it's easy um as i've gotten older i had kids of my own um i was very fortunate um to be able to spend time with them but it's tough and and that's another message you know you know kids need to understand that i mean with what's going on out there things cost money and parents need to work and it's very stressful and and i and it's really difficult at times. And my parents made that sacrifice and I'm an only child. Um, so they were always there for me. I never wanted for anything. Um, and it was, you know, as a kid, you don't necessarily show appreciation. You, you know, you think, you know, I've got stepkids now that are younger. I think you generally think like, well, it's what parents are supposed to do. They're supposed to buy me this and buy me that. We're supposed to go out to eat. We're supposed to go on vacations. And man, it adds up and it adds up quickly. And to be able to just pump the brakes a little bit and, you know, give thanks, you know, for what we have and and appreciate what we have is sometimes difficult to do. Another person that, that helped you during that, that time period was your high school basketball coach, who was your eighth grade basketball coach um, before that. Can you kind of tell us the story about, because it sounds like he was definitely a tough love coach. And right. maybe not necessarily a style that you loved, but you were able to not only get through it, but thrive through that. Can you tell us your mindset and, and how you kind of got through that and then what it led to with, with KU and that recruiting uh-huh. process? Yeah. And, and I really didn't know anything different. My dad was my coach up until that point. He was a yeller. If you didn't do what you're supposed to do, you're going to yell that. That's just what, what happened. And every coach I ever had was like that. And, and Steve Simons, Coach Simons, was that way in eighth grade. We won the state championship as eighth graders and going against Chicago schools, um, definitely the underdogs, but we played together and did what we were supposed to do. Um, and then he became the varsity coach when I got into high school and um, instilled a lot of discipline, a lot of, I mean, some of the rules, you, know, you couldn't see your girlfriend on game days and things that going back then, you're like, what, what, what are we doing? You know, you had to dress up on game days. Like, what's the point? But what it does is it, you know, it teaches you discipline and focus and where your mindset needs to be. And yeah, it's a high school basketball game, but it was still, it was something that was important and you kind of learn that. Um, so I didn't know anything different. Just, you know, he was a Bob Knight disciple, so to speak. I mean, he really, that was kind of how, how he was. Um, when I first started getting recruited, he had asked me, it's like, well, where do you want to go? What do you want to do? And I said, coach, I'll play for anybody but Bobby Knight. And and, and I'd been to Bobby Knight's camp for three years. I'd, I'd kind of seen it. I've watched it on TV. Nothing against him as an X and O coach. Obviously, one of the greatest it's ever been. Just didn't want that for my college experience. And, and uh, he understood. And um, I was fortunate. And, again, this goes back to without those certain people, we wouldn't have – things wouldn't happen. He was – he had been working in Coach Brown's camp. Larry Brown, who was the coach here when I came, um, and, and had asked Coach Brown for some assistance in trying to find a junior college or a place for a, a teammate of mine who was a year older um, to play. And, and they just happened to start talking about the kind of player that Coach Brown would like to find, you know, the team he was trying to build and his mindset. And my name came up. And, you know, in those days, you had a, you know, VHS tape or whatever. And, you know, he sent some tape. And, and again, just the right place, the right time, the right series of coaches and relationships. It doesn't work that way now. I mean, it's all about your national rankings and, and how you play in the, in the big showcase tournaments. And my experience definitely wasn't like that. 
And if it weren't for Coach Simons and if it weren't for Coach Brown taking a chance on me, I'd never be living in Kansas. I can promise you that. So you were part of a, a, a pretty good uh, freshman class going into KU. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think it's fair to say you were probably the least heralded. Um, <laughs> that's, that's more than fair. That's entirely <laughs> accurate. Absolutely. Thank you. You're being very kind. So what was what was that like? I mean, obviously, University of Kansas has a storied history. Um, what was that like? And what did you think you had to prove when you got on campus as a freshman? Well, it was it was difficult in that, OK, I'm, I'm away from my parents. <clears throat> you know, I have to kind of figure that out. But I was very welcomed, um, even, you know, you know, Ron Kellogg and, and um Calvin Thompson and, and Dryling and that group that was that were just was leaving. They were just leaving. They were very welcoming to me. And then you've got the, you know, Danny and Chris Piper and Archie and, and these guys that have been around and were just coming off a Final Four run. Again, very accepting of me, despite it all. I think what benefited me is we all have some ego, but what benefited me is is I was really genuinely happy to be here. Um, and I, it was, it was, I felt like it was on me to prove that I belonged. Um, I wasn't going to do that above the rim. I wasn't going to outrun anybody or push anybody around on the block. I had to do that how I knew how, which is just play good, smart team basketball, whatever that was. Um, and so I was true to myself. I didn't try to be something that I wasn't, but it wouldn't have mattered without great teammates who, who accepted me and they, you know, they looked at me and I'm six foot five and 160 pounds soaking wet and wasn't putting the fear of God in anybody. Um, but they passed me the ball. They, you know, they trust me on their team and they, and, uh, and eventually that became the trust that I was trying to build with coach Brown, but it would have been very easy not to be accepted when you've got Mark Randall, McDonald's all American and Kevin Pritchard and, and uh, and Robert Coyne and Keith Harris. I mean, these these were big time recruits that were brought in. And then there's Jeff Gilder, you know. And so it helped in a lot of ways that there were no expectations of me. No one was looking at me, expecting me to to start or to play major minutes. And and it it really helped kind of help me come along slowly without a lot of undue pressure. Well, and and just to make it clear, obviously Larry Brown is a Hall of Fame coach. He saw something in your skill set, but also mm-hmm. was looking for the right pieces for that team, as I understand it. And and a good teammate is is important. But you also right. are still one of the best three point shooters in the history of Kansas basketball. So right. you weren't totally devoid of skills, right? Uh, no, just no, no. By being at KU, um, so let's fast forward to sophomore year the 87, Mm -hmm. 88 team. And that was a team that was expected to win the national championship early on. I mean, there were a couple Mm -hmm. of publications that, that predicted that. And then Archie gets hurt. And, and there were some other folks that came into the program Mm -hmm. uh, with high expectations and maybe Jeff Geldner was not considered the uh, starting guard early on in the season, but, but that all changed, uh, again, probably because of the things you're talking about, good teammate, and you knew your role. And I think if, right. if, if anything describes that team, and they, they you know, continue to call it Danny and the Miracles, but if, if players don't step up like they did that entire season, there probably wouldn't have been a championship. So can you, can you no. talk about that season and how it all kind of gelled together and how you dealt with the adversity during the season? Yeah, well, there was a lot of it. And, and one of the things you understand when you get to uh, a place like the University of Kansas, so really college basketball, or, or even so if you go to a job, a new job, there's always going to be new people coming in. There's always going to be the new shining star, the person who's supposed to you know, take your place or to, you know, um, has all the notoriety and, and those that are there have to continue to do what they do and play within themselves and do what their job is and, and, and do their role. And we had a lot of guys, not a lot, because the team's not huge. We had several guys that had a lot expected of them that just did not take to coach Brown, <clears throat> that, whether it be the discipline, the yelling, the, you know, very condescending type of coach that he was much like my high school coach. So it was normal to me. Um, they didn't take to that. Mark Randall, my best friend in the whole world, struggled playing for Coach Brown. And you see what his career became when Coach Williams came. It's just that, you know, that mindset of being able to mesh. But we had to 
kind of figure a lot of things out on the fly. Um, some people that were supposed to play intricate parts of the team or, or roles on the team weren't even on the team anymore. They were kicked off or they quit. We wound up bringing two football players in just to help us practice. And, and what a blessing they became as far as bringing some toughness and attitude and fun and, and, and playing their role on the team. And it was kind of, for me personally, um, I don't want to say last man standing, but everybody kind of got a shot. And it just wasn't working. And we were 12 and eight at one time. And I had no idea I was going to start. We were in Stillwater and Coach Brown, you know, we were just about ready to go through our pregame kind of rundown of who was guarding who and who was going to do what. And he put my name on the board. And I'm like, okay, whatever. I mean, it's still basketball. I still had to go out and I knew the place. And I knew the goal was to get the ball to Danny as often as we could and let him do his thing. Um, and that makes playing basketball a lot easier when you've got a great coach and best player in college basketball. My job was just don't screw up, play good defense, don't screw it up. And I, I happened to get a, a three point opportunity early in the game, made it, <clears throat> and uh, uh, was assigned to guard John Starks. Didn't go very well. Um, I couldn't handle, couldn't handle him, had some real quick fouls, but we won the game. And Coach Brown was very superstitious, and, and that kind of led to the next start and the next start. And, he never stopped believing in us. I mean, here's a coach that had been through a lot and we're looking at each other and we're 12 and eight wondering if we're going to make the NCAA tournament. Uh, but he, he saw something in us and continued to coach us hard and believe in us. And eventually we turned that corner. And a big part of that was our leader, Danny, understanding that he had to play like the best player in college basketball. He could no longer defer. He could no longer just be one of the guys. He had to go out, take the game over. But yet the rest of us still had to do our jobs. He couldn't guard all five people. He couldn't score all the points, get every rebound. And we really found a way to mesh together. And then the guys that came off the bench also understood their roles. You know, they may have thought they should have been starting over me, and probably some of them did. Um, but they accepted what they were supposed to do. They knew they were going to get their chances in their minutes. And, and as long as they did what Coach Brown wanted them to do, and more often than not, we did that, and and uh, just kind of rode the coattails of Danny to, to cutting down nets. After that season, obviously, Danny <clears throat> graduates, uh, and you get a new coach. Coach mm -hmm. Brown goes off to the Spurs. Roy Williams. Most people didn't know who he was. Obviously, Coach Smith uh, with Kansas ties recommended him. Uh, he was a longtime assistant coach, but it looked like you know, I won't say questionable, but people just didn't know what he brought to the table. And you guys right. just won a national championship under a hall of fame coach. Um, what was that like adjusting to, and you were, you you were changing your, your style of play as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, how did you adjust to that? Again, a, a big change kind of in your life, multiple changes, what was your attitude and how did you successfully maneuver that change? Well, you know, for me personally, again, I go back to it's still basketball and there was a reason why I was there. Um, and it was an opportunity to, um, you know, continue that dream of playing college basketball. And if I didn't do what I was supposed to do, I was not going to get that chance. And, you know, when you look at what we lost in terms of our leadership, it was hard. And then you, and then you factor in, we didn't work very hard that off season one. We thought we were pretty special because we won a championship. So we didn't, we weren't in the kind of shape that we needed to be Two, we went a good portion of the summer without a coach, um, spent way too much time having fun and, and not enough on getting ready for the upcoming season. Um, and so it was difficult. And then when you, when you talk about on the court, you're asking, you know, Milt Newton, who a uh, great player, great friend of mine, great guy, Scooter Berry, same thing, to all of a sudden now be Danny and Chris Piper. And that's, those are big shoes to fill with a new coach. And, and, and as you mentioned, and new recruits coming in, um, it was difficult. But at the same time, um, nobody felt sorry for us. We were still Kansas. Everybody wanted to kick our butt. That's the same way today. And you really didn't have a chance to – uh, feel sorry for yourself or you were going to get embarrassed every night. And so we had to uh, basically figure it out. Now, the, the coaching style was drastically different. You mentioned, you know, with Coach Brown, it was maximize every possession, you know, work the ball, get the best shot, get it to Danny, whatever, and then play great defense. Well, with Coach Williams, it was let's play fast, um, and which was a lot more fun. 
Um, it, it allowed me the freedom to, you know, shoot the basketball, which everybody likes to do that. Uh, but you still had to play as a team. And it was also a much more structured environment. Um, gone were the three and four hour practices where it was a lot of scrimmaging to everything being very regimented, where you know, every 10 minutes you're doing something different and you'd run at the end and you're out in two hours. I mean, there's just so much different, but that's life. I mean, whether you start a new job or you get a new boss or you get a new product or, or whatever it is, you know, we're constantly in our lives dealing with change. And, and you have to understand that, realize there's very little we have control over in our lives other than how we react to certain to adversity, how we react to change and what we do and, and how we work through it. And our job was to play basketball for the University of Kansas. And, and we took a lot of pride in that. We, we did the best we could. Um, had some high moments on that jun- on my team my junior year, but we were on probation. There wasn't that big motivation to try to get to try to repeat. Um, not sure we would have made the tournament anyway. Um, so it, it was a difficult year, but uh, and definitely a year of transition in a lot of ways. But when you're riding the coattails of a national championship, it kind of takes away a little bit of that sting. When you talk about change, I can't imagine, and I, I think few people can, what it's like to be a basketball player on the campus of the University of Kansas, <laughs> because you're all rock stars, regardless of the role you play. Uh, and so you you went through four years of that, and then well, and then I think you were there maybe a little extra to finish up graduation. But mm-hmm. what what was the transition like between KU basketball um, student athlete at KU and then moving to the quote unquote real world? What was that adjustment like, and what was the biggest challenge? Well, the biggest challenge I think for anybody, and, and I look at my daughters who are, you know, come out of school is what are you going to do? You know, it's not, you know, take the basketball out of it. Um, Cause there's the, part of it is a little bit of relief. You don't have that grind um, and you don't have the appreciation um, when you come out that you do year as the years go by. I have a much greater appreciation and sense of pride for that program now than I did at that time. At that time I was like, okay, I just played basketball. Now I could bust fun and, you know, sleep in or whatever, but eventually the reality comes that you've got to figure out what you're going to do with your life. Um, I knew that I wanted to stay in the area. Um, I felt like my best opportunities to find gainful employment um, was to be in this area. What I didn't want to do is just hang around Lawrence and be that guy. Um, So I chose to move to Olathe. Ironically, I then took a job back in Lawrence. So I'm and then fast forward, I moved back to Lawrence only to quit that job and take a job back in Kansas City. So I, I just kept doing this. Um, but, you know, the biggest thing is really just the, the challenge of growing up. And, you know, everybody's got to do it. Um, you know, you've got to figure out what you're going to do with your life. You still got to pay your bills and, 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 uh, Let's not kid ourselves. I mean, you're still very well recognized around town. You're, everybody still wants to talk to you and ask you questions. And, and uh, there, there are a lot of bonuses, if you will. Um, but you still have to understand. And it's di- even much more different now with cell phones and social media. I mean, my goodness, we were in a fishbowl. These guys today, it's off the charts. You can't sneeze without seeing it somewhere on, on the Internet. Um, and you understand that and you understand that people are watching. You have to do things the right way. You, you know, from my perspective, that's how I was raised. Stay out of trouble. Do what's right. Uh, work hard. Do what you're told. And if you don't, there are going to be consequences. And so many of these things seem simple, but I think a lot of them are getting lost today and what's going on. Is it fair to say that um, once you got into the business world, that I, this won't sound right, but but you you had been a successful athlete, part of a successful program, and then there wasn't consistent success in the in the business world. There were right. there were obstacles and mm-hmm. challenges, and and can you go into that period of your life a little bit and and how yeah. you kind of. Um, reacted to that and, and moved forward? Yeah, I mean, I mentioned the, the 
the short term job hopping. You know, I think that I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that personally. Very few people come out of school and know exactly what they want to do and they go get hired and they stay with that company for, you know, for however many years. Mark Dobbins, who played at uh, uh, Kansas State, good friend of mine, was actually married to a cousin of my ex wife's, got to know him really well. He's one of those rare guys that got to stay at one company the whole time. So at the time, you think you're jumping around, but you're also trying to figure out what you want to do. And I landed in the cell phone industry, selling cellular phones back when you actually sold them um, and, and had really good success in Lawrence, moved to Kansas City, um, successful there, um, got married and uh, moved on to the handset side, but still very successful in the industry and, and uh, doing very well. But as that industry started to kind of write itself, we were making too much money for no more value than what we were bringing. Um, and you know, companies were getting out of the business, laying people off. I was laid off, got a severance, got brought back, got laid off a month later, got another severance, got hired by another company. Two years after, got laid off, got another severance. And about that time, my father-in-law at the time was diagnosed with cancer. And, and uh, um, so we, you know, we as a family talked about a lot of things, uh, but I made the decision, nobody made me do it, but I made the decision at that time to get out of corporate America. And, um, I was fortunate that um, there was some family money that allowed me to do that, but I made a bad decision. I made a decision to take myself out of the grind, if you will. <clears throat> and you lose that work ethic. You lose that desire. You lose that, that pressure of paying a bill. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, a month becomes a year, becomes five years, and it, it's hard to get that back. <clears throat> and, and I did it to myself. <clears throat> while it was a conscious decision, looking back on it, it was a horrible decision for me personally. And uh, it's not like anything else. If you, if you stop doing something for a while, it's really hard to get it back up and to get that discipline again. And uh, as I went through my divorce and cancer and, and uh, I, was, I owned a used car dealership because everybody thinks that'd be cool, um, was losing a lot of money as fast as I could lose it. Couldn't do, couldn't sustain that. There was no way. And, and, you know, I was on a Craigslist trying to figure out what I wanted to do um, and what I felt fit my um, skill set, which was building relationships and selling. Not to mention, I really wasn't qualified to do anything else. Um, and responded to a Craigslist ad um, that didn't mention what it was, just the characteristics that they were looking for, that the guy was looking for. And I'm like, this sounds pretty cool. I hope to God it's not selling insurance because that's the last thing I want to do is sell insurance to anybody. I mean, I've avoided that for, you know, 20 years. Lo and behold, what is it? It's health insurance. So I'm like, oh, God, are you kidding me? But um, again, I gave, I gave Scott Ackley at Apollo the, the courtesy of the, of the interview. We started talking and it was the perfect fit for me at that time. And if, if I wouldn't have, answered that ad and talked to Scott and really found that it would have been a good fit. I never would be still doing this today, doing, doing well and very happy with, with my life. But it's just those little things, those little decisions, and then the people that you come across in that period of time that you, know, you, get, you get choices. And what are you going to do with that choice? You know, are you going to choose poorly? Are you going to choose, choose well? And I made some bad choices, you know, getting out of the work world and different types of jobs and, and, and my mindset wasn't right. But uh, Scott saw something in me. He, it was just the right opportunity at the right time and, and uh, very thankful that I made the decision when I did. And there are a lot of choices when you have a major health issue like mm -hmm. cancer and, and this was mm -hmm. major. So can you, um, can you tell us, you know, your first reaction and then how did you, how did you move forward and what was your kind of your strategy for, you know, kind of winning that battle? Well, I, uh, roughly December of this would have been 2009. I noticed that I had a little lump on the side of my neck and I asked my wife at the time, like, you see this? I mean, maybe, it, you know, and, and, you know, generally people think, Oh, it's just a swollen lymph node. You had a cold or a sinus infection or something, no big deal. And, um, after the first year, it didn't go away. Um, and so I went and made an appointment and kind of started the process through my doctor. And he's like, well, I think you probably should, let's get you to an ENT. And so 
went through that appointment. The the uh, had a had a an MRI, had a fine needle biopsy. They were all negative. Um, and I sat with my ENT, uh, David Rudman, uh, Dr. Rudman at Menorah. And I'm like, what do you think? He's like, I, I think might as well just take it out. And I'm, and I'm like, good. That was what I wanted to do. Let's just get this, whatever it is, let's just get it out of there. Um, so I woke up from that two hour procedure. Um, and at that time one was told that I had cancer and it, it, while he had me opened up, he went and got multiple other second, third, fourth opinions because he didn't like what he saw. And again, I look at the process of my doctors and the protocol that they went through and, and what they did. If they wouldn't have done that, if things wouldn't have gone, if the lump wouldn't have shown, what, where would I be or would I be? Um, and so from that point forward, once you hear those words, um, it's, okay, it's game on. What are you going to do? Uh, what, what is it? What type of cancer? Um, I learned that there's very um, kind of strict protocols for different kinds of cancer. Not all treatments are the same based on the type of cancer. This was squamous cell carcinoma. It was stage four. Um, and I was told, this is what we do. We're going to do chemotherapy at the beginning. We're going to do chemo in the middle and chemo at the end. We're going to have the 35 rounds of radiation. And this is what we're going to do. And I'm like, all right. And it was, I was an emotional mess. There was a lot of crying at the beginning, but then you quickly have to transition into, okay, cancer's not going to beat me. And although I knew I wasn't going to beat it by myself, I was going to have the help of medicine and my family and support. Um, I still had to make that decision that, okay, it's not going to beat me. I might have some horrible side effects and I do still have, them. um, but cancer wasn't going to win. There are too many people that love me that wanted me to be around. My kids needed me to be around. Um, and so we started that process and it was, although it wasn't a long process. I mean, my surgery was or February 25th by the middle of May. I was finished with treatments, everything. I mean, I was in a lot of pain because of the ongoing impact of radiation, but no more treatments. Um, and then you're like, okay, what, what are we going to do here? How's this going to impact my life? My swallowing, so I don't produce saliva on the left side of my face, my speech and all these different things. I'd lost 40 pounds. Um, and then coming out of that, oh, I'm going to get a divorce. And so it was a horrible, horrible time for me. Um, and, you know, looking back on it, um, you know, it's, it was a lot, it, but you don't have a choice. I mean, you, there's nothing you, no one's going to, you know, you're an adult, you got to pick yourself up. You got to figure out what you're going to do. Um, my ex-wife and I kept our focus on the kids. You know, I kept my emotions inside for the most part. There was no reason to be overly angry or bitter or let my kids see that. I mean, they needed their parents and, and they needed me to be around from a health perspective. So I was not only dealing with that, but okay, now I'm getting a divorce. I got to find a place to live. I got to find a job. What the hell am I going to do? Um, and you know, it's, it was hard. And, but there were a lot of people, a lot of friends, family members, um, that were, that were there offering advice, you know, essentially being my psychotherapist, you know, sitting down and all right, what do you, you know, whether it be getting back out and dating, whether it be, you know, trying different jobs or whatever, you know, get back out there and figure it out, you know, you got a lot of life left to live. Um, and that was really my mindset was cancer's not going to win. I don't know what I'm going to do a lot of other places, um, career, family, that kind of thing, major set of circumstances, but it, that was life. And I had to figure it out. And people have dealt with a lot worse situations than I did. That's not my point. It's not a woe is me type of book or situation. Um, it was hard, but everybody deals with hard. I mean, there's all kinds of hardships out there. And, you know, the overall message is that, yeah, you got to keep going. You got to keep trying. You got to, you got to keep working. You got to keep believing in yourself. And, uh, I was fortunate, um, again, in a great situation, um, a lot of both emotional and physical support with family and, and, uh, and friends to, to why I made it through it kind of came out the other side. Well, and, and, and certainly the, the resilience and overcoming obstacles is, is, is an obvious theme in this <laughs> book. Um, but you, you tell a lot of great stories uh, um, to illustrate some of, some of these, these points, but 
uh, the, the gratitude, the appreciation for all of those people throughout your life that helped you get through those different periods of time, whether it was your coach and the recruiting process or your parents, and, right. um, your family as you went through cancer, uh, teammates all along the way. Um, but you've also, you've done some mentoring yourself. You have, you have helped others uh, and maybe in, in ways you don't even know. I, I'd like you to talk about some of the things maybe that, that you have done or are doing, but this is a small example just for my personal life, but my son and I were in Allen field house and <clears throat> excuse me, you and uh, Dave Stewart, I believe mm-hmm. uh, we're preparing mm-hmm. for Jayhawk game day live. And I wanted my son to meet you as a member of the 88 national championship basketball team, but we didn't want to bother you because you we're obviously preparing for this. this I don't show. do a lot of preparing. That's the running <laughs> joke. I don't do a lot of preparing. Dave does all the preparing. I, I show up with a blank piece of paper and just start talking. <laughs> I, I think that'll be when I hang it up is when I can't do that anymore. Uh, but anyway, I don't mean to interrupt. I apologize, but you're giving me well, way too much credit. So you kind of, you didn't say that, but you asked <laughs> if you had a, if you could take a picture and, and you were, so gracious and just had plenty of time for my son. And you were like, Oh no, we've got, we've got time. And, and so again, that's not a, for you, it may not have seemed like a huge thing, but for my son, it was. Uh, And just for you to, to spend the time and make him feel important was, was very gracious. And, and uh, you know, he appreciated that, but, but I know that you've done some other things in the community uh, and as, is that because of the the folks that that helped you along uh, when you were younger and throughout those tough times? Yeah, yeah, and you know, and you you, you kind of learn and kind of multifaceted answer here. But you know, growing up in a small town with with one one parent that teaches at college and the other one teaches at grade school, everybody knows who you are. So you're used to people paying attention, and you're used to feeling like you need to do right by people because if not somebody's going to see you and they're going to go run and tell your parents and then you go to KU and you're in that push fishbowl and everybody knows you and they want to you know they're looking you know everybody's watching um so you know to your point at the game I mean why wouldn't somebody be like that I mean I'm just up there talking and and, you know here we are at the greatest sports venue in the world I think Allen Field House um and as I mentioned as you get older you really appreciate the fans. I mean, I listen to people that come in there and they're like, oh my gosh, this is Allen Fieldhouse. And they're parading around, they're looking at all the things. And it's like, I, I've said it to Dave many times. Do you know how fortunate, and Dave's a K-State guy, but he's, he's not really, um, how fortunate we are to come here so often. This is like nothing, but this is a bucket list item for so many people. And, and so, um, you know, I, I kind of look at things like, it's hard. I mean, we all get caught up in our lives and, and, and the responsibilities that we have and, and weighted down, whether it be about bills or family situation or, you know, the stressors. Um, but people always, more often than not, people make the time for me, whether it be my parents, whether it be coaches, teammates, um, you know, doctors, whomever, uh, they all took the time for me or enough people did. Enough people cared about me to um, give me options to, to, to talk to me about, okay, here's, here's kind of what we need to do. Here are your choices. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? Um, nobody let me wallow in my pity. Um, nobody, you know, there was no feel sorry for me. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I was very adamant about this book when we started and and kind of carried through is I didn't want it to be a look at me. It wasn't a look at me. It's a look at them. And then hopefully the reader can take that and look at those people in their lives, whoever they are. And the sooner we can acknowledge those people, the sooner we can give them the credit that they're due. Um, and it really became magnified for me as I, as I was coming out of my cancer treatments and, and everything else. And it was, um, it was kind of a raw thing, but the doctors would ask me if I would talk to other people that were recently diagnosed. Um, and I'm like, I will. I mean, you realize I'm not going to blow sunshine up their butt. I'm going to, because nobody did that for me. Dr. Rudman was very tough love. Um, and I appreciated that. I didn't want to hear that. Hey, it's going to be a piece of cake. You have a little nick here on the side here. You know, it's going to be over with in a couple of days. No big deal. 
um, because that's not reality. Um, And so as I talked to these people, you know, and and they were all so appreciative of kind of the realness of the conversation of what to expect. And, and I found that they were like me. They didn't, they didn't want it sugarcoated. What's this going to be like? What what am I going to feel? How's this going to, you know, transpire? And, um, you know, and, and, and so that's obviously a real world situation. It's life or death um, without trying to be overly dramatic. It really is. I mean, you have to, you know, not just the cancer part of it, but the mental health aspect. You've got to be able to maintain your mental, your mental health and be able to get yourself up every day. And, and, uh, and we see the, the impacts today in, in society of people that are just not able to overcome the demons. Um, and unfortunately, there are some guys that I talked to that went through it that weren't as successful at doing that. And it's hard. Um, and I look back, you know, what makes me different? You know, why was I, yeah, I learned resilience playing sports and I learned, you know, to, you know, be tough and overcome this and not cry and not show your emotion, all these things. But sometimes things are just that, that big of a deal to where you kind of need to let it go. And cancer kind of taught me that, um, I'm probably overly dramatic, overly emotional about certain things. Um, but if someone wants to talk, they've got an ear with me. Mark Randall was a great sounding board for me, um, still is. Um, you know, we've all, we all go through stuff. You know, maybe not everybody goes through cancer, but maybe a, a family member's touched with it. Adversity is going to come. Crap's going to happen. I mean, it just is. Um, the sooner you realize that, realize you can't really control it. All you can do is, is, is work through it. Uh, and lean on the people in your lives that that was my mentality. And so if I could be that person for somebody else, why would I not be in it? To your point about Alan Fieldhouse, I'll take a picture with anybody. If, if they still think that taking a picture with me is, a, is, is cool. I mean, what a great feeling. I mean, especially, you know, in, in, in a location like that. As I mentioned, the book has really cool stories and I really enjoyed reading the, some of the stories about you and Mark Randall and, and that, that time period, uh, and even earlier in your life. Uh, and you mentioned the emotional part after going through all of that, how, how did that, uh, I guess, in addition to writing a book, how did that change your life? Uh, were there other things? Do you parent differently? Um, are your interactions with people different or what other impacts did that have? Yeah, I think a lot of ways. I mean, um, I, you know, we learn from the people in our lives and, um, my parents, what I learned, what I discovered and learned through the years is they did the best they could with what they knew. I I didn't necessarily agree with it at the time. Uh, and as, as we get older and have our own kids, we get to make our own choices, good and bad. Um, you know, so I learned, you know, my dad was really hard on me. I mean, if I didn't score enough points, get enough rebounds, get enough hits, whatever, we wouldn't talk. Um, did I like that? No. Did I think it was necessary? No. But when I look back on it, I wanted, I wanted to be good. I wanted to show him that, hey, I can go four for four every game. I can get 20 and 10, whatever it is. Um, and it motivated me. It was an, Now, was he doing it to motivate me or was he doing it just because he knew or he thought he knew? what I could do and I didn't live up to that potential. I don't know, but you know, my kids, same thing. I coached them until they weren't really, I mean, um, and then my youngest is playing basketball at Drake right now and and she liked to be coached hard. And so, you know, you look at, um, and you learn, uh, from other people and, and you learn from situations and, and as you kind of go through life and, and, face challenges, you, you kind of fall back on those lessons that you learn from other people or, or maybe an experience that somebody else had that you hadn't gone through personally. And um, I, I've had great role models in my life. I've have had great leadership in my life that I've been able to learn from. I've had some bad too. You can learn from negative experiences, bad bosses, you know, bad relationships, whatever. I mean, they're all learning experiences to try to shape kind of who you are and how you're going to deal with things. Because life really is a series of choices and you get to decide how you're going to react. Are you going to get mad? Are you going to, are you going to, okay, let's pump the brakes a little bit. Let's kind of work through this. Are you going to get jealous? Are you going to get sad? You know, what I've found post-cancer is I'm just much more emotional. Um, never cried when I was a kid. Never cried. I don't know that I cried, you know, really up until I got sick. Um, no matter how injured I was, I certainly wasn't going to cry. Um, but man, I can, you know, if I were to watch a video right now of, of a, a country music song of, you know, 
whatever I can, you know, I can try. Uh, or if I, I think about the military and first responders and there's just, there's certain things that a team watching a team come together and how they react and how much the love they show for each other, man, it, it it's close. I mean, and it's, and it's, uh, you know, I basically have accepted that. I understand there's no, it's not a sign of weakness. Somebody might laugh at me and my wife will laugh, laugh at me. Oh my God. I'm like, it just, here it comes. You know, I'm having a moment. Just let me have this moment. And I'm going to have a whole bunch of them, you know, with kids getting older, getting married. And, you know, my, my youngest daughter is starting her senior year of that's it for her playing basketball. I mean, that was a huge part of my life. It was her coaching her and then watching her play and it's almost over. And so I know what my parents dealt with. I was an only child. And so I know what they went through and, and I know they did the best they could and they love me. And no, we weren't a huggy kissy. I love you type of family, but they were always there and I never wanted for anything. And, and I try to be that type of parents for my parent, for my kid, as well as my stepkids. The book is without you. And <clears throat> this is a fake copy because as we're recording I like that. This, yeah. I'm like, wow, you've got a copy and I don't. <laughs> I got a manuscript <laughs> and I, yeah. and I made this up. But um, it's a great book. There, there's a lot of, of stuff we didn't cover today. So I encourage everyone to, to order the book. They can do that at jeffgeldner.com. Uh, yep. And there, you've got three Hall of Fame coaches uh, uh, participating in this. Uh, Mark Randall with the forward and uh, a lot of great stories, a lot of wisdom in that. Uh, Jeff Geldner, I know that not everyone, even though they should be, uh, is a KU fan, but I think after reading this book by Jeff Geldner, they will be Jeff Geldner fans. So thank you so much for your time, for your message to the folks through this book. Um, look forward to seeing you on Jayhawk Game thank Day you. Live. And yeah, next we week. Appreciate you're joining us on Espresso Yourself with Chuck. I appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. And, and again, hopefully there's something that every reader can take away from it. Um, and, uh, you know, it, 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 was a, it, was a, it was a challenge. Um, unfortunately, with, with, I had somebody like Jeff Boyd to kind of keep me on task and to, and to ask the right questions and to kind of work with me and to help put my thoughts on the paper. Um, you know, the, the goal is not to look at Jeff Gildner, but to really look at your own life and, and to think about, you know, who and what played a role in you getting to where you are. And I think there's a message in there for, for everybody. And hopefully that makes its way through. 